You're listening to Bible Prophecy Daily, a weekday podcast where Bible prophecy matters and matters greatly. Greetings, fellow believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I will talk about salvation after the rapture. Perhaps it seems strange, but there are many people who believe that there will be no salvation available after the rapture. However, the Bible clearly indicates that many will be saved after that event. You know, the universal principle and invitation for salvation is stated at Joel 2.32. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, this is stated in connection with the arrival of the day of the Lord and, of course, is valid throughout the entire period of judgment. But it's quoted by Paul at Romans 10.13 as a general principle. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation has always been the same. The basic message of the gospel, as it has been since Adam's fall, is reverence God and give him glory. At Ecclesiastes 12.13, Solomon wrote, When all has been heard, the conclusion is reverence God and keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. That's why the gospel is called the everlasting gospel at Revelation 14.6. Genuine reverence toward God is expressed through total trust, that is faith, in his character and plan, and for forgiveness of sin and spiritual life with God, It is faith in the messianic promise. That is, the promise that God would send a savior to redeem man from sin. It was always faith in the person and work of the promised Messiah savior. Those in the Old Testament were saved by faith in the coming of the savior and his work of redemption. New Testament people are saved by looking back to the historical reality of the Savior's work of redemption that was accomplished by Jesus on the cross. Now, this expression of faith is indicated by the phrase, calling on the name of the Lord, like at Genesis 4.26. Then men began calling on the name of the Lord. And as we saw at Joel 2.32, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved along with Paul's quote at Romans 10.13. Notice also Acts 22.16. Ananias says to Saul of Tarsus, Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins by calling on his name. So now, after the rapture, there will still be many people left on the earth. Many, if not most of these, will be those who have accepted beast worship and have taken the mark of the beast. For these, there is no chance for recovery. Because taking the mark seals one's destiny to reside in the lake of fire for all eternity, as can be seen at Revelation 14, 9 through 11. But for those who have not taken the mark, they will have a chance to trust in Christ until the final evaluation. Out from among these, many will be saved by total trust in God and the person and work of Jesus in just the same way as we are. The fact that the rapture will have taken place does not in any way affect how someone gets saved. Now, there are really needs to be additional converts after the rapture in order for both Jews and Gentiles to go into the earthly Davidic kingdom in mortal bodies. These will be believers who go in, not unbelievers. And although the earthly kingdom will begin with only believers, all who are born after that 
must face the same issue of whether to accept Christ as Savior or not. Uh, eventually, over the course of that thousand-year period, the influence of spiritual truth will become watered down, and there will be many of the people, in fact, a vast majority, who will reject Christ and his gift of salvation. It is these who are organized by Satan when he's released at the end of the thousand years, and they will then overtly rebel against God and Jesus and attack Jerusalem. This is uh, recorded at Revelation 27 through 9. Now, let's look at some evidence of salvation after the rapture. First, of course, there are the 144,000 Jews who are converted after the return of Jesus. We find this at Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Some uh, thoughts here. If they were saved before Jesus returns, they would go up at the rapture. Uh, they are mentioned after the sixth seal, which is when Jesus returns. All the sixth seal tells us is here he comes and it is uh, 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 he is bringing wrath. But we know that when he arrives, the rapture will occur immediately. And of course, we are shown the result of the rapture at Revelation 7, 9 and following with the multitude of saints located in heaven. At Revelation 7, 1 through 3, the 144,000 are viewed as still unsealed and still needing to make a salvation decision to believe. Furthermore, the wrath of God is actually held back until everyone in this special group gets saved. And uh, they are not sealed after the day of the Lord's judgments. Revelation 7, 3 says, don't do any harm until we have sealed. Also, we find at Revelation 14, 1 through 5, the same 144,000 uh, clearly described as believers in Christ. Reading there, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. These have been purchased from mankind as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. The significance of the term first fruits is that they are the first ones to believe after the return of Jesus. Uh, by the way, this fact also means that the 144,000 do not constitute the woman of Revelation 12 who flees into the wilderness to hide. For these servants can't function as servants if they are hiding in the wilderness. The ones who flee into the wilderness are unbelievers, but citizens of national Israel who reject the rule of the beast over them. In addition, if they were believers, or if they were of the 144,000, then there would not be a distinction between them and the ones mentioned at verse 1217, who are described as those who keep God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. There's another factor. At Revelation 9-4, the demon locusts hurt only those who don't have the seal of God. Well, that indicates that not only will every believer get the seal, but that there are, in fact, people on the earth who are believers during the trumpet judgments. Uh, of course, there are at least the 144,000 servants who are believers and are alive at that time. Next, we have the ministry of the two witnesses. At Revelation 11, we learn about the two witnesses who have a worldwide ministry that will culminate in Jerusalem. These two will testify for exactly 1260 days from the midpoint of the week until its end. Thus, both before and after the day of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord return of Jesus, which will occur at the sixth seal. These two are uniquely protected from physical harm until the end of their ministry. The nature of their ministry, of course, is confrontational. It's a ministry of judgment, condemning and afflicting those who oppose them. Yet the content of their message will still be, indeed must be, the everlasting gospel. 
Of course, their actions and their message will be known throughout the world, probably through the technology of modern media, if not through a personal um, geographical location at some time. Uh, the fact of this worldwide impact is seen at Revelation 11, 9, and 10, where we see the joyful response at the death of the witnesses from peoples, tribes, languages, and nations. Now, proving the identification of these two witnesses is not pertinent to the study, nor does it relate to one's particular rapture view, but I believe they will be Moses and Elijah. With that in view, the activities associated with them find correlation with what Moses and Elijah did and with what is prophesied that Elijah will do. So with Elijah, we find an afflicting judgment type ministry and one that specifically appeals to national Israel. He exhorts them to return to true Messiah worship, thus proclaiming the everlasting gospel. And in the case of Moses, his judgments were directed against the Gentiles in Egypt to motivate them to obey God. At Malachi 4, 5, and 6, we find, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Concerning this, Jesus said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things at Matthew 17, 11. Restore all things here refers to Israel's acceptance of the messianic promise and restoration to spiritual union with God. Just as Paul wrote at Romans eleven twenty six, all Israel will be saved. Now, let's look again at the 144,000 and their ministry as servants of God. After the rapture, the everlasting gospel will be proclaimed to the whole world by the continued ministry of the two witnesses and the 144,000 servants. The 144,000 are called servants of God because they are serving him by proclaiming the gospel. Uh, some have problems with seeing them as evangelists. But think about this. The only service that makes sense in the context of the end times is evangelistic in nature. Well, after the conversion of the 144,000 Jews, they will be given the privilege of taking the everlasting gospel throughout the world. And of course, if the gospel is being proclaimed, the purpose is to gain converts. As I stated earlier, Revelation 14, 6 and 7 gives a summary of the gospel invitation. Reverence God, give him glory, and worship him. This constitutes faith in the plan of salvation, which is faith in Christ. At Isaiah 52, we learn about the messengers of God who will witness during the day of the Lord judgments after the return of the Lord. At verses 8 through 10, listen. Your watchmen raise their voices. They shout joyfully together, for they will see with their own eyes when the Lord restores Zion. Be cheerful. Shout joyfully together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has com comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, so that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. And at Isaiah 62, uh, in verses uh, 6 and 7, there will be messengers within the city of Jerusalem. On your walls, Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen. All day and all night, they will never keep silent. You who profess the Lord, take no rest for yourselves, and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem an object of praise on the earth. There will also be messengers outside the city, same chapter, verses 10 and 11. Go through, go through the gates. Clear away for the people, build up, build up the highway, remove the stones, lift up a flag over the peoples. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation is coming. 
Behold, his reward is with him and his compensation before him. Thus, the message of the everlasting gospel is going to be proclaimed in several ways. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment will continue to make an impact. In Jerusalem, specifically, we see that a large group of people will respond to this gospel message. It will happen at the end of the 70th week, right after the two witnesses ascend into the sky uh, at Revelation 11:13. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest became reverent, and gave glory to the God of heaven. So after the earthquake, it seems that most of the remaining Jews in the city are convicted by the spirit and express reverence toward God and give him glory. This expression recognizes and accepts God's plan of salvation, and they trust in Jesus as Savior. The gospel message, which had been being proclaimed since the rapture, is fear God, give him glory, and worship him. And that is exactly what these people did. The word that is seen in most translations as were terrified should read, they became reverent. This is an aorist middle indicative of ginomai, which means to become, and then uh, plus the adjective emphabos. This adjective occurs only five other times. Sometimes means to be afraid, but three times it means to be reverent. Luke 24, 5, Acts 10, 4, and Acts 24, 25, and 26. This group of people that are designated as the rest will not include people who have taken the mark of the beast, for those beast worshipers are sealed in their rejection of Jesus. And so we find in Jerusalem at this time a large group of people who are unsaved, resistors to beast worship, and yet have not been killed off by the beast. Now, it's very possible that there are many Jews hiding in Jerusalem, staying underground to hide from the persecution activity of the beast. And during the trumpet judgments, the ability of the beast to implement his persecution activity will be greatly hindered. And it's possible that many people will be emboldened to venture out to find supplies and to hear the testimony of the two witnesses. These people have been resisting beast worship, and through the testimony of the two and through the earthquake, many of them will be convicted and accept the gospel message that has been proclaimed. This is how we can find so many believers in Jerusalem and the vicinity as uh, the inhabitants of Jerusalem at the time that the armies of the world invade during the Armageddon campaign, Zechariah 12, 5 through 8. We find this uh, statement, a strong support for us are the inhabitants of Jerusalem through the Lord of the armies, their God. At Isaiah 59, 20, it says, a redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. Paul, who quotes Isaiah at uh, Romans 11:26, writes, Thus all Israel will be saved. This means that there will come a time when everyone alive on the earth who is of Jewish descent will be saved. After Armageddon, during the next 45 days, the Lord will remove the fat sheep from the lean. That is, he will remove the Jewish unbelievers from the Jewish believers. And the believers will then constitute the saved nation of Israel to go alive into the earthly Davidic kingdom. At Ezekiel 34, 15 through 24, As for you, my flock, this is what the Lord God says. Behold, I am going to judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Behold, I, I myself, will also judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. I will save my flock, and they will no longer be plunder. And I will judge between one sheep and another. Then I will appoint over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them. 
he will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Also at Ezekiel 20, 33 and following, As I live, declares the Lord God, with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I assuredly shall be king over you. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant and I will purge from you the rebels and those who revolt against me. As a result, the only people of Israel left alive will be believers. It is then uh, that it can be said, all Israel is saved. Well, we're not done. There will also be many Gentiles who become believers after the rapture. We know that the universal aspects of God's covenant with Abraham includes the Gentiles for the promise is in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed this includes both salvation as we can see at galatians 3 8 and it includes the physical blessings which will be realized by the gentiles who enter the earthly davidic kingdom the egyptians are mentioned specifically many citizens of egypt will become believers before the battle of armageddon Isaiah 19.17 says, The land of Judah will become a terror to Egypt. Everyone to whom it is mentioned will be in dread of it because of the purpose of the Lord of hosts, which he is purposing against them. Uh, but this terror upon Egypt, uh, upon Egypt will become a source of blessing. Uh, continuing at Isaiah 19, God's judgment on Egypt will be both striking and healing. When this terror is experienced, it will elicit in the inhabitants of Egypt a response of trust toward God. The people will call out to God and God will deliver them. The invitation of Joel 2.32 applies to everyone during the day of the Lord. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thus, Egypt will have a large population of people who become citizens of the kingdom of God. The blessing on Egypt that is described here is because they called out to the Lord. Uh, there, of course, will be many people of Egypt and throughout the world who do not take the mark of the beast. These will turn to the Lord during the time of oppression, and Jesus will rescue them. Continuing at Isaiah 19, verse 21. Thus the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. So the people of Egypt will be impacted by the message and accept it. I suggest that this impact will be made upon the people during the time period from Christ's arrival in the clouds and his physical descent to the earth several months later. Isaiah 19.21 continues, describes their worship activity during the earthly kingdom says they will even worship with sacrifice and offering and will make a vow to the Lord and perform it. Uh, Isaiah 19.22 gives the summary of the judgment and the blessing. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing, so they will return to the Lord and he will respond to them and will heal them. Now, Assyria also will have people who respond to the gospel and together with Egypt will join in Israel to worship the Lord. Uh, Isaiah 19, 23 and following, on that day, there will be a road from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. On that day, Israel will be the third party to Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the middle of the land of Palestine, whom the Lord of the armies has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. There will also be many people from the other nations who become believers during the day of the Lord judgments. As a result, they will survive those judgments and go alive into the thousand-year 
earthly Davidic kingdom. After the dust settles from the Battle of Armageddon, and before the earthly kingdom begins, the surviving Gentiles of the world will be evaluated and des uh, as described by Jesus at Matthew 25, 31 and following. This, of course, will include the people of Egypt and Assyria that were mentioned in Isaiah. The sheep believers will be divided from the goat unbelievers and judged accordingly. The believers will be accepted into the eternal kingdom of God, which will begin with the earthly Davidic kingdom. The unbelievers will ultimately go into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. These Gentile believers will come to Israel to worship the Lord during the earthly Davidic kingdom, as we can see at Zechariah 14, 16. Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. Jeremiah 3.17 tells us, At that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will assemble at it for the name of the Lord, and they will no longer follow the stubbornness of their evil heart. Now let's look at Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. Uh, we know that all Christians will be raptured at the day of the Lord return of Jesus. The only ones left on the earth will be unbelievers. But out from these, many will get saved. The beast will still be reigning and trying to implement his agenda of beast worship and persecuting God's people. However, his activity will be greatly restrained because of the trumpet judgments. Even so, out from among these believers, many will still be martyred, beheaded by the beast. He will still have a little bit of success in persecuting both Jews and Christians. So to review, the tribulation will start at the midpoint of the week. There will be many difficulties for those who don't worship the beast, as indicated with the seals 2 through 4. And specifically, many will be killed for their faith as indicated by the fifth seal. Then, after the tribulation, at an unknown day and hour, the rapture will occur and all believers will be removed from the earth. These, together with all who have previously died, will be taken to heaven to appear before the reward seat of Christ and given their rewards. Then will come the trumpet and bold judgments of the day of the Lord, wrath of God. Then will come the battle of Armageddon. After that, before the kingdom starts, another group is raised up. We see these at Revelation 20, verse 4. These are those who were martyred between the rapture and Armageddon. It says at Revelation 24 that we have the uh, ones who were raptured mentioned first. It says, I saw thrones. And they sat upon them. These souls are in resurrection bodies and sat down on thrones. This is the raptured saints in heaven. Then it says, Those who were martyred at the hands of the beast after the rapture are raised up. The vision continues. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads and on their hands, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now there are clearly two groups of saints in view. The second group can only be people who became believers after the rapture, and they will join with the others to reign upon the earth together with Christ. So yes, the rapture will be the closing of a door, as it were, and there will be great wrath and judgment from God and upon those uh, who are left on the earth. First Thessalonians 5.3 says, Then ruin will come upon them suddenly, like birth pains upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Second Thessalonians 1.8 says, Dealing out retribution on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. But as long as there is life, there is hope, and anyone who has not taken the mark of the beast will be able to choose God and believe in Jesus for forgiveness of sins 
the salvation of their souls, and the possession of everlasting life. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. May the Lord richly bless you all. Until next time, have a great day. Thanks for listening to Bible Prophecy Daily. We hope you learned something valuable today. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. 